Here we go. There's always something new to learn. And here in Rogue Kitchen, we learn by playing with our food. It's Rogue Kitchen Live. Hello once again, everybody. So glad you could join us today. Today, boy, it is warm outside. Uh, it's, we're creeping towards the end of summer here, unfortunately, but we've still got quite a few weeks left. But right now, uh, you know, we're harvesting a bunch of different uh, different vegetables and fruits, and and um, you know, where some things are kind of on their way to ripening, and and you know, we've got some herbs, and we've got some wonderful little tomatoes. Uh, we've got cherries. We have peaches. Um, you know, so we've got we've got all kinds of stuff. One of my favorite foods, actually, uh, learned how to learn how to cook with a long time ago, are green tomatoes. So these guys I pluck right out of my garden here, and uh, these are actually perfect size. We're going to make some fried green tomatoes today. Oh, yum! And we're going to put that with uh, some goat cheese, a basil pecan uh, sauce, and we're going to take some of these little some of these little plum and cherry and pear tomatoes here. All right, we're gonna toss those with a little bit of oil, maybe some lemon juice and some fresh herbs, salt and pepper. Uh, and we'll kind of dress the plate with that. All right, nice. And then we're gonna look, we're gonna look at another type of fruit that is cherry shaped, and of course they are sweet cherries. We're finding these in a the grocery store like crazy. And um, you heard me say it a few weeks ago, one of my all-time favorite, if not my all-time favorite dessert is a fruit crisp and um my absolute favorite is a rhubarb but um i wanted to do some cherries just because um cherries are so wonderful i love to snack on them and, yeah my, um, my kids love <clears throat> cherries especially right now oh yeah cherries are great then i've got another cool uh kitchen tool actually i think i have two kitchen tools um to uh, uh to show you today and one of them is a cherry pitter so uh, we'll go through how you know see how that looks um so and right now i've got a couple of uh of our cherry crisps in the oven here just to just because they take a while to bake so i'm going to check these guys out and see how we're doing oh man they're looking really good on those guys there so um now i had mentioned uh peaches a few minutes ago there and so you ever find you know, like a lot of recipes you find during the summer months are you, you you grill up some peaches, right? You have wonderful Palisade peaches that we get here in Colorado. Or um, and, uh, so what I did with these guys, I just put some cinnamon in the bottom, and let them sit there for about an hour, and then took them out to the grill, grilled them up. All right. Um, but a lot of times I'll cook these um, to have after dinner, and of course we'll have some left over. And so what I like to do with those then is. Uh, you can either buy a pie crust or make one or use a piece of, piece of puff pastry, all right? But we'll cut these guys up, roll out a little pie dough I've got over here. Uh, we'll make little free-form peach tarts there on that. That'll be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. All right. So yeah, Somewhere um, in between there, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, fermenting vegetables. Uh, yeah. You know, everybody's got cucumbers coming out of their gardens right now. Um, I'm sure someone on your street has cucumbers and they're trying to get rid of them. Um, it's kind of like squash too coming up here pretty soon. Everybody's got zucchini and you know, what do you do with it? Um, so I've got a, just a quick um, ferment on some uh, cucumbers that I got at the farmer's market on Sunday. Um, and we'll, I'll just show you how to talk a little bit about brining, fermenting, make sure you got the right solution and go through that process. Yeah, very nice. You know, we've got... Uh, canning is one of those things we like to do with all these fruits and vegetables that we, that we get at the end of the season there. So that'll definitely be very, very useful on that. So, um, yeah, so my other kitchen gadget that I wanted to uh, show you all is dental Kitchen floss. gadget. Why would you <laughs> use dental floss as a kitchen gadget? I'll show you in just a few minutes. It's kind of fun. Uh, you can also use fishing twine too for this uh, particular process that we're going to do here. So, wow. All right. Where do we start? Well, you know, we've got to get these desserts going, right? So we need to get those cooked and get them chilled down a little bit. And the fried green tomatoes don't take that, really don't take that long. So 
let's go ahead and uh, I've got kind of a, a crowded space here, so um, but uh, I will I will make the best of it here. But let me go ahead and turn down the yeah. Let, let's see that camera here. There. Now fried green tomatoes. Mm, all right. You said you, you used to do this a long time ago. Yeah. Was that when you were in the south? Yeah. So yeah, I was at the working at the uh, Farrington House in in North Carolina, and um, we actually had a fried green tomato eggs oh, benedict nice. that we used. So we breaded the uh, uh, fried. You know, we cut the fried green tomatoes first thing in the morning. During the summer months, we plucked them right from the garden. Uh, that, that was just outside the door of the kitchen there. Uh, but each morning, yeah, we grab about 10 tomatoes and slice them all, have them in the reach in, and then we would bread them and fry them to order. And then while those were frying, we would poach our eggs too. Uh, and then we had a, um, uh, like a Hollandaise Beurre Blanc kind nice. of thing, uh, that, that we cool. did. So, um, so yeah, we did that. And then, uh, we also had an appetizer too. We did with it, or no, it was on the main dish. It was a cashew crusted trigger fish. That's a great Oh man, trigger fish is yeah. so cashew good. Cashew crust is always really good. Very, too. very good. Yeah, cashew or macadamia nut? I don't remember, but um, either way, it was or a great, pistachio. great little dish. <laughs> it could, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? All right, so let me show you how this uh, this cherry pitter works here, and then we will get our. Um, I'll explain the uh, the uh, filling here. So, so like I said, we just. We've got this little thing, and you know, a lot of times we find that, you know, if we try to pull our cherry apart, of course, you know, then our hands get all messy, and you know, we've got juice everywhere, right? So this little cherry pitter is kind of fun, um, in that it it still takes a little bit of time, but to do this recipe, I think it's like three or four cups or something of of cherries. It actually doesn't. Not, it, it doesn't take that long. Um, I did some earlier, and it took me maybe ten minutes to get them. That's not too bad. But you know, with these guys, we can just pluck our our stems right off. Man, I wish I would have thought of this invention uh, a long time ago. But we just pop our cherries right in like so, and it doesn't even. We don't even have to. You know, you have the stem in there right on the cherry, right? You have the stem part there. That doesn't even have to line up. All right, but then this right here, so you've got your little dish, they sit down inside, you have the pit catcher there. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so those, those little metal things. And then you've got... They look, are they little crosshairs? Yeah, they are, and they look kind of, yeah, kind of scary, bit. don't they? But, uh, yeah, so those little, those little blades there are kind of curved, so as it comes together there, it collapses down, and those metal things come through and pop that pop that pit right out of your Sweet. cherry for you, for you there. Let's go ahead and take a look and see how and that works. For those works. of you watching, like if you look at your olives, any of your pitted olives or pitted cherries that you buy, you'll see that little crosshair, the little X. Um, and they're using something very similar. Like, I mean, this was invented hundreds of years ago and it's very simple, but just continues to be useful all around. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, all right, so. So we just, yes, yeah, so we've got our cherries in there. We just close it and we just tap it down a bit. Uh oh, it locked on me. There it goes. Oh. Did they come out? They didn't come out. Uh oh. Well, this was working uh, great earlier. Yeah. It's because we're on, because we're live. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's we're live. That's right. It always, stuff always happens. They're going the right way there. Sit down in there. There, there we go. Look at those pins. So now we've got six six cherries. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh-oh, the cherry didn't want to let go of its pit there. So, oh, wait. we got to find that again. No, I think we got them all. So, all right. Well, let's try that one again. Let's see if we can get, uh, can get it to work a little bit smoother there. But, so, again, you just have to reload it each time. There we go. Maybe it wasn't sitting in there properly. Now, so if you, there. Again, so for those of you at home, if you don't have one of these, uh, you can totally, you can take a, uh, I've used a straw and just kind of use that to punch it out because it'll kind of 
the straw will cut through the flesh and then push the uh, pit out. And nowadays with the uh, stainless steel straws, yeah. they're even sturdier. So you can sit there and just punch them out like that. Oh, stainless steel straw. That's a great idea. Really good. All right. So I'm just checking our oil back here. You know, I take, I'm taking a chopstick. Jimmy, can you see this okay? You can see the bubbles there at the bottom oh, of the Let me chopstick. switch here real quick. Yeah, there we go. So that's that's how you know your oil is hot enough there. Oh, so nice. So you can temp that if you like at about 300, 325 degrees. Yeah, we can see these. the heat coming up They're off not, that. Yeah, you can uh, use a little chopstick there, put it down in there, and it bubbles up from the bottom there. You know your oil is hot enough. So. All right, so we'll try this cherry pitter again. Sorry, Jimmy, didn't mean to make you switch no, back and good. forth that's there. Good. But that's what I'm here for. Uh, real quick, Diane, Aunt Diane, hey again. Um, Excuse me one second. Aunt Diane has had your fried green tomatoes, and they are the bomb, she says. Oh, where'd you go? Sorry, Jimmy, right here. <laughs> thought you Alice. left me. Uh, Alice, Susan, hi. Thanks for watching. Uh, let's see here. And Kathy Rice, Jason's made these for us, and they are wonderful. Oh, yeah. Both in North Carolina and here. All right. So, again, the cherry pitter there. So, we close it up. Tap it down in there. I'm going to have to get that a couple times or so. There we go. Now we got more, more cherry pits in there. So, that's just added on to what I did before. So it's kind of a cool little tool, you know. It only does, it just does six at a time, but it does more work for you than if you have to sit there and peel the cherries with a knife. And it gives you whole cherries too to put inside your crisp or your pie or whatever else that you're using. You could even throw these into pancakes yeah. too, you know. It saves your fingers from getting um, all red too. Your pancake. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now they just had a cool little machine to do that with beets. <laughs> That'd be fun. Uh, it's called uh, nitron gloves. <laughs> nitron gloves, that's right, yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, so now that we have our, pull these guys out here real quick. Oh, yeah. Set those aside here for one minute. All right. So now here, I've got, we've got our cherries. All right, that's the one cherry that I threw in there. But we've got our cherries. We've got our sugar. Um, I threw in some lemon zest and some orange zest as well in here. Um, we've got our we've got our cornstarch. You know, a lot of times crisp recipes will have flour in them, and I'm I'm not a big fan of the flour. I like I like the cornstarch a little bit better, but that's just that's that's personal yeah. preference. Um, citrus adds a really nice flavor, especially for cherries. Um, adds add, adds a really nice uh, flavor on there. So we're just going to go ahead and dump our our fruit in there and we give it a little toss like so. All right. And then great thing about this, this dessert is you can put it into a big pan, like a larger, uh, larger pie pan or something like that. Or you could even do like little individual cups like this. And, um, we could, uh, then we just need to spoon our, our mix. This looks like the perfect recipe for these little things that I got years ago that I, you know, I'm, I'm always like, what do I do with this thing? I've done mac and cheese in it, which is pretty cool, but then it's always too hot for the kids. But I think this would be great because you could cook it, let it cool down. So maybe, maybe I'll do that. Yeah. Next. And it's always, and it's, it's okay to overfill these guys too. We'll throw a little bit of our coating in there. Um, you could smush these up a little bit to where they're, you know, they release their juices. I let that happen in the oven there, but all right. And it's, it's nice having that pitter because like you said earlier, you have the whole fruit and uh, with crisps, sometimes, sometimes when you get a yeah. crisp, the fruit's too mashed up and you don't know what it is. And it's just like this ominous berry crisp. Yeah. Um, I, I always like having Great. that texture and like the whole berry or the whole cherry or something. Yeah, and I think sometimes crisp recipes they they you cook they might cook a little too long, you know. And I like like you, Jimmy. I like to have that texture in there and know what I'm eating. So, all right. So then 
we'll take our crumble mixture. And this crumble mixture is, is awesome. This is something I learned a long time ago as well. Um, but uh, it has oats, pecans. Um, I've got the recipe around here somewhere. I apologize. Um, we got like one cup of flour, half cup of melted butter, uh, I think a quarter cup of oats, um, like a quarter, a half cup of pecans. Um, and I think about one half cup or three fourths cup of uh, flour in there. Um, but this crumbles up really nice. This is the crumble that I used a couple of weeks ago for that, um, that crisp oh, ice yeah. cream that I made. Yeah. And this is something that you can kind of you make in bulk and kind of keep in your fridge too, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You can, yeah. Yeah. You can keep it raw like this in your freezer and pull yep. it out when you need. Um, in the, you know, you can uh, put it on a sheet pan and bake it and then just sprinkle it on top of something, you know, like pancakes, it's great on pancakes or waffles or on top of ice cream or something. So it's always fun. So, all right. Um, so I'm hey, over. Real quick, just you may want to turn the heat down yeah. on your oil. It looks like it might start to smoke a little bit. Oh, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. I know your family would appreciate down. that too because nobody likes that smell in the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Brooke Definitely. is particular about that. Um, yeah, so was yeah, so was Molly. That's interesting. <laughs> well, I mean, so, she works with hoods, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, she know. Yeah, she works with kit with with inside inside air quality and ventilation. So yeah, you bet. Um, all right, so we've got these guys filled up. So we'll just kind of sprinkle this stuff on top. All right. Might be a little too much there, but there we go, like so. And pop these guys in the oven. All right, let those go for about 20 minutes there. And with and the magic, of course, when they come out of live TV, like magic, yay! Dump those guys off there. All right, we've got our our crisps here are already done nice. up. Yeah, see, like without Take moving it around off. too much, it's, it definitely cooks and settles, releases the liquid. Um, looks great. So now we've got, so we've got some nice little sauce in there. See, it's not too thick either. Nice little run there on the sauce. All right, so. Throw some ice cream on that and you're good. And there you go. And that's it. That's it. So. Easy cherry crisp there. That's great. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, so here, just moving forward, we'll come back to our cutting board here. I'm gonna set it back over here. Uh, I don't know about you, Jimmy, but <clears throat> man, sometimes I can't make a pie crust to, uh, to save my <laughs> life. I don't know what it is about those pie crusts. Well, yeah, I, I've got a recipe and maybe we should do that sometime. Um, but it's super easy using a food processor. You just put everything in there, just zip it a few times, throw it in the yeah. fridge. You're good to go. Uh, but yeah, no, it's still a struggle yeah. sometimes and you gotta make sure your butter's cold. And, yeah. It used to not be my favorite thing at all. And then I did it, used to do it every morning to make uh quiches for, you know, a couple of years straight working at uh, the breadboard up in Greeley. And, uh, I got a hold of it pretty quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something I've been ever been able to do for some reason. So anyway, I'm gonna give it a try today. See if this if I can get this guy to roll out. But here I'm gonna make this uh this little peach um peach tartlets here. So I'm gonna cover this guy with a little piece of foil here. Um just roll this guy out. Rolling into a round shape. That, that's, that's always the challenge. <laughs> that's always the challenge. You know, this thing's kind of a rustic, uh, kind of a rustic tart there. So we'll uh, we'll see how it turns out. But we definitely want to we want some some bite to our to our tartlet. Yeah, so sure we don't want thin. yeah. So we don't want to roll it too thin. And these are kind of like in, like individual tartlets, you know. Um, 
so we don't need anything really big and these bake fairly quickly so that'll be good all right I think that's, yeah, good. That's, a, that's pretty good just, that's not bad it's it's rustic could be a lot better but it's rustic it's rustic all right so we're going to set that aside for a second bring back our cutting board all right we'll take a couple of our leftover grilled peaches here we can just kind of dice these guys up you know we just want like bite-sized pieces right we don't want something too big here this already has the cinnamon and the sugar already on it so we don't really need to uh, toss it with anything else or flavor hey, you said it up or anything these grilled peaches so. were from a recipe before right what what did you have with what did you have with them that's correct yep. Yeah, you know, sometimes the kids are always looking for a dessert, you know, and so just have some peaches and yeah. during the winter months, even yeah. apples or just a grilled half a peach with uh, some uh, whipped cream on it. Oh, yeah, it's great. All right, so now we'll take our our peaches here and we'll put them in the middle of our, of our little pie dough here. Like so. I said that's a personal one. Let's maybe get a. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll spread those guys out. Maybe a Personal little bit peach more. <laughs> Personal peach dinner. Personal peach dinner. Yeah. All right, we'll throw a few more pizzas on here to I'll take up that space. All right. And we'll uh, when you fold this guy over, we just kind of fold one side and you just kind of overlap it all the way around. Just like little pleats, nothing too fancy. Yep. Yeah, I used to do an apple crisp yep. like this in a indulge wine bar, working with Daniel Hyman before. Oh, nice. Yeah. You can put an egg wash on there if you'd like. I think we got enough butter in this pie crust. I think we'll be all right with that. We'll just sprinkle a little bit of sugar on there. So we'll get a nice little caramelization on there. Pop that guy in the oven. Out here in a little bit. Crisps are still doing well. All right. So now, as our desserts are cooking, we'll take a look at our uh, fried green tomatoes here and get those going. All right. Yep, Alice, you can never have too much crisps. I agree. Crisp is always the best part of the whole thing. Uh, let's see here. Mahaley, good to see you again. Thanks for joining us all the time. Hey, Mahaley. Uh, let's see here. Yep, Kathy, never too much grumble. Make we're all in agreeance. Um, and a little dollop of goat cheese is really good on fresh peaches. That, agreed. A little dollop of goat cheese, and then I'm going to throw a little bit of a drizzle or a balsamic reduction on there, and maybe a little bit of basil on there. Yeah, you know what? Oh, that'd be even good on this uh, this little yeah. tart too. You know, a little, a little goat cheese on there with balsamic drizzle. That'd be awesome. That'd be great. Uh oh, roll a, roll away tomato. Okay, so on our fried green tomatoes here. You know these things are again they're unripened tomatoes, right? So they're they're got a, quite a bit of a sour flavor to them. Uh, they're definitely going to have some crunch to them, right? But we don't want to cut them too thick. You know, yeah, because you still want so it to cook. Because uh, um, if, you, if you go too thick, you're going to be biting definitely. into basically like a raw tomato. Yeah, it's going to be really sour, and it's just yeah. not going to be fun. So. so actually, I have one more kitchen gadget. To, I'm showing all my kitchen gadgets today, all, all of our kitchen gadgets today. But this is what we call a tomato shark. So you can see it's... It's kind of like a melon baller, but it has a uh, little serrated teeth on it there. And that's for taking out that little core right there. So that just goes right in, right on top like so. And digs right in. And just scoops out that core like so. Now we don't have that core in our tomato, and we can use this top there slice right there. So do it on this other one here as well. Yeah, Molly Ward says hi. Green hey, Molly. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Molly. Um, 
All right, so we want to cut our tomatoes um, a little bit wider, maybe about as wide as a pencil there, a number two pencil. All right, so we'll cut them about so wide like that. Because also, right. if you cut them too thin, when you go to fry them and they release some of that water, like the, the breading will actually kind of get a little soggy. Um, yeah. And then they get really floppy. You still want it to have some structure to it, and especially when you fry it. Um, and then it's kind of like that. That might be a little too thin. Yeah, that. uh, that's pretty good, though. We'll, we'll, we'll bread that guy up. So, All right. So we cut our tomatoes. And then, of course, we did this a couple weeks ago when we had. Uh, we had our chicken dish there, so we'll, uh, but we've got standard breading procedure here that we do, and that we use in the kitchen. So we've got some all-purpose flour. I didn't put any seasoning in that. I save all the seasoning for, for, the, uh, uh, for the crust here, all right? But then we've got some whipped egg here, okay? Uh, and then, of course, we've got our panko and our cornmeal here, and this cornmeal is what gives gives a really cool, crunchy texture to our fried green tomato. Um, so it's something different than just breading and, uh, you know, than just all panko. Even though panko has a nice, crunchy texture to it, uh, that cornmeal adds um, adds a, an extra crunch. Yes, yeah, so it's, it it's got it's a little bit more of a sturdy crunch. Like, so yeah. panko is like really airy. You bite it, it yeah. feels crunchy, but then just kind of disappears. Uh, yeah. The cornmeal kind of like... You bite it, you can still feel it in your mouth. That's still, that's a little bit more al dente, if you will. Yeah, definitely. And also, it gives the tomato, um, the the end product there, kind of gives it a little, like little yellow specks in it, which are, which are kind of fun. So it's also a very okay. southern breading procedure. Yep, definitely. Yeah, we yeah in the south you cornmeal on a lot of things. So you know, so we just put our tomatoes into our flour here. Just enough to lightly coat it here, all right. And again, this now this becomes my dry hand, so I put it in the uh, put it in the egg wash there. And now I'm going to switch to a to a wet hand here, and so I'll take my wet hand and we'll coat our tomato with the egg there, all right. And we'll plop that into our panko mixture here, and we'll coat them. We kind of pat it down a little bit. All right. So we're taking a look at your uh, your oil back there. I don't know if you turn it off. You might want to get it back on. Okay. Well, it's 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 got a low heat on oh, it. There you so go. I think we, okay. Should be then perfect. When you're done, you've got. What's that? So it should be perfect then. Yeah. Hopefully. So then when we're done, we've got this nice little breaded tomato, green tomato here, and it's okay if we don't get all the edges. You know, it's kind of a. Kind of going rustic today on a lot of this stuff. So, all right, and we just go through and we we uh, bread up all of our tomatoes. All right, and then so and then the process, of course, of doing this is, you know, it's just kind of the same thing over and over and over again. You just flour, egg, breadcrumb, and you just repeat the process until it's all done your breading all done and uh good to go so you know it's nice yeah it goes pretty quick once you have that procedure down that the flour helps the egg stick that egg helps the breadcrumb stick and the cornmeal yeah you knock it out pretty quick yeah definitely i just did chicken cutlets last night too oh did you nice yeah i like doing the breading procedure i like yeah, Corner Post started steps. doing a uh, chicken, uh, working with a chicken farm down there. And it's uh, called Pasture Bird. And so they're sending out some uh, pasture raised chicken. We got some chicken breasts in our last uh, box from them. So. Oh, nice. And cool. they're by no means any sponsor of ours, but you know we've worked with them before. And I personally love their meats, but Corner Post is amazing. Check them out. You can get uh, yeah. meat delivery boxes. Both Jason and I do it, and I really don't buy meats anywhere else. Yeah, same here. We do. Uh, um, actually, we we thought we signed up for a monthly box, but I think it's just a one-time box. But I think um, on their website it says they weren't taking any more orders or something for a little while. But uh, yeah. either way, either way, no, it's a great 
Uh, it's a great company and um, uh, really enjoy their meats and all their products. They even get some really nice fish. Um, I had some yeah. Yeah. from them a, a couple days ago and it was, it was actually really, really good. So. Okay, so now we've got our our egg, or excuse me, our uh, green tomatoes breaded there. There we go. End piece there. Ready for the fryer? Now, yeah, I think we're ready for the fryer here. I'm going to um, wash off my hands, get the egg off of it there. And then we will get to frying here. All right. Uh, Jason, I think we're frozen on your device again. On the phone? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can. Ooh, that guy's hot. Yeah, it's temperature needs to cool down a bit. Okay. So, maybe I can bring this on over here. There we go. And I can That'll work. Kind of show a little angle there. Man, that, that phone gets really hot there. Okay, so, of course, whenever you deep fry something, you always want to make sure that you slowly put it in, kind of put it away from you there. And these are going to cook fairly, fairly quickly, so definitely need to keep an eye on them. Um, we don't want to get them too brown. There, we'll start with that. All right, we just kind of let them uh, fry here so we don't get them sticking on the bottom there. And while you're frying those, uh, Kathy says the same process is great for zucchini squash. Yeah, and so this breading procedure is really great for all kinds of veggies. Uh, so squash, uh, green tomatoes, zucchini, um, yep, yeah, all, all kinds of veg. Um, and Cindy Klein says, hi, Jason. Uh, fried green tomatoes are yummy. I remember when you used to cook, when you cooked them one time for us. Delicious. All right, so now I'm just going to flip these guys over. So that was maybe, eh, we can go a little bit longer, but that's okay. And you want them just to get, get like nice. just barely golden brown, right? Yeah, just barely golden brown. We don't, but that breading is already set on there. So that's not peel. So it's not peeling off, which is good. There you go. All right. We'll take a look at our crisps and our, Pie here, woo! Oh, Looking good there. there go. Pie, pie is definitely making there. Nice. We've got a little puffy crust. Yeah, going. you can see that pie crust starting to puff up and kind of wrap around yeah. all the peaches. Yeah. And actually, that pie crust recipe is a uh, compliments of Chef Jennifer Watson at MSU Denver. Thank you, Chef Watson. If you're out there, I think she's on vacation this week. Oh, nice. Awesome. It's nice to try to get a vacation in these days. Yeah, and that's actually the pie dough that we will use for our uh, baking and pastry class. So. Oh, very cool. Our baking and pastry class where we will be in the kitchens for a little bit, right? But then we'll also be doing some live cooking just like this. Yeah, we'll be doing, we'll be doing some classwork in, on campus, and we will also be doing some home projects for the students as well. So that'll be fun. I'm going to grab a little bit of paper towel here and yeah, you want to be ready to grab those out of there because once they start to brown, they'll, right. they'll definitely start to go quick. So now we've got a nice golden brown color on there and nice and crispy. And the breading is sturdy. It's holding up. We're not piercing through our, our tomato there, which is good. Drop these other two in. All right. Now we just have to be sure that we uh, keep an eye on those guys there. There. And so, uh, so Kathy's asking if we'll share the pie crust recipe. We can uh, we definitely get that uh, typed up and post that up in uh, the comments or discussion here. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So. Okay, so while those are uh, those are cooking, and, and we've got our other fried green tomatoes here, we'll uh, go ahead and get on our little sauce that we're going to do here for it. And this is 
fairly simple. We've got some pecans, we've got a jalapeno, we've got some Parmesan cheese, we've got some fresh basil and some fresh parsley here that we're going to use with that. So, um, you know, just basil straight from the garden there. You can, um, let's see if we can get some other bigger leaves here. And, you know, basil is one of those herbs, it's, it's very, it's very tender or it's very soft, very prone to bruising. Yeah, and, um, and you can't so, store it too cold. Yeah, definitely not. It wilts. Wilts really fast. Pretty, well, it was amazing. Yeah. So we just got back from a road trip. We went up to Idaho and the Grand Tetons and got out in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And uh, we brought some basil from our neighbors across the street in a bag and kept it in the top of our cooler. Um, which is the least cool part of your cooler. Uh, you reach right about 50 degrees. And uh, that basil stayed fresh. We used most of it, but like I still had some left when we got back and I pulled it out and it was still good to go. So that just right. attests to the fact that like, you really can't have your basil in the fridge for too long. Um, King Supers has even started storing all of their basil outside of the cooler, next to the cooler. Um, so yeah. in, the, in room temp where it's about 60 five degrees or so getting a little bit of the cold air coming off the cooler. So just a little tip for you at home. Um, if you keep it in your fridge, keep it in the warmest part of your fridge, uh, which yeah. is going to be the door. Yeah. Sometimes I'll keep basil in um, our little crisper drawer there and it just goes, it goes bad very quickly. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. So I've got our basil here. And so what I want to do is I kind of want to sh just chiffon on this. Yeah, I think we've done this a few times. Oh, did we freeze somehow? But when your knife is, is really sharp and you get done. All right, Jason, we lost you there for a second. Uh, right before you started shifting on it, so oh, you said it. Okay. You said anything of importance? Let's repeat that. <laughs> well, I was just explaining how to shiffin out the basil, and then yeah, we've you know, done that a few times on the show. Yeah, and that uh, you know you definitely want a sharp knife uh, when you when you shiffin out basil or um, really any kind of green herb other than rosemary. But you want to use somebody else's knife when you use rosemary. Um, <laughs> It or at least time. plan on sharpening it right afterwards, right? Yeah. All right, and we just take it and we kind of line it up, line up our basil one more time, and we just kind of do the same motion as we did as we did with chiffonade. I'm just holding those herbs down. We just kind of want to chop them up a bit there. Okay. Move those off to the side there. We'll take our. I like adding this jalapeno. It, it adds just a really nice flavor. Adds a little bit of heat to it. Um, yeah, to our sauce. jalapeno and basil together. It sounds good. Um, what I want to do here, though, is I want to take out the seeds and the pith here. Okay, that's where all that's where a lot of your heat is. Okay, and so I kind of just want the the pure flavor of the jalapeno in there. And so we'll just kind of cut that cut that off there. A little tip for uh, those of you out there with, you know, either fair skin or just are sensitive to uh, um, jalapeno. Gloves are definitely nice. They, you can get yeah. latex or nitrile gloves at Costco, King Supers. Um, I was actually recently cutting some jalapenos, and normally I'm fine. I have some pretty thick skin on my hands. Um, I think it's yeah. getting, they're getting a little bit uh, lighter since I'm not in kitchens as much, but. Uh, Usually I'm fine. The next day, my hands were still burning. So, you know, really? just be careful if they're really, I mean, they were some fire jalapenos. So watch out for that. <laughs> Maybe taste them first. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. So I'm going to take these other fried green tomatoes out here. In the meantime, check our crisp and our pie dough here. So we're going to take a look at this guy. Oh, yeah. He's looking really good on that pie dough there. Looking good. Crisp. Yeah. You know what? 
I'm going to take out the crisps. So if you can see this here, kind of, can you see that bubbling at all around the edges? Or oh, yeah. Tilted? Oh, don't drop Bumble. it. Don't drop it on your computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that looks Bubbles good. Around. That's when I like to take it out. So and bubbles up around the edges. I'm good to go on that. So Very cool. Uh, I, think, I think we'll stop there. I'll grab a little clean bowl here. I'm going to go ahead and put our, our basil into here. All right, and then you got chopped basil, like kind of, jalapeno. Yeah, and you can put the jalapeno. You, you can do this in a food processor if you wanted. I would also uh, save you your hands. <laughs> really fine. Yeah, save your hands both from the jalapeno and possibly in the. But I just like to cut these really, really small. Just a fine little brunoise. Uh, yeah, little tiny brunoises there. If you're looking to impress your friends. A little kitchen term, brunois. Brunois, yeah. And then just throw that right in. Right. You can also do this with cilantro too. You can do jalapeno, cilantro, um, pecans as well. So I think we'll stick with that. We'll put in our our pecans. Now I like using a, a pastry pastry knife here, a pastry cutter. So you can use this to make biscuits. You cut in your, your butter and your flour. I like to use it for um, pecans as well. I mean, if I need to chop up some nuts here. So some pecans, I like some pecans. Yeah. Hey, that's you know, always quick. To... That's really quick. Because a lot of times when I'm chopping pecans, they just go flying everywhere. That's, that's nice because you can be kind of gentle with it and kind of slowly crush them. Yeah. You know, if they're toasted, they're going to... They're going to jump a little bit more. They might, you know, they might fly a little bit more. Jump, or you can just jump put them in the pecans. Bag. What's that? <laughs> just said jumping pecans. Oh no. Jumping pecans. Yeah. All right. Or you can put them into a little plastic baggie and use a uh, a meat mallet too. And, yep. Um, or a rolling pin. Yeah, the rolling, rolling pin, pin earlier from the pie. You can use that out. Yeah, just kind of crush them up a little bit. All right, so then we're going to add a little bit of our or a wine bottle. Parmesan. <laughs> there. No need too much there. Okay. So now we've got this wonderful little dry mixture here, like so. Almost like a gremolata. Yeah, kind of, kind of like a gremolata. And then we'll take some, some olive oil here. Put that in. You kind of want a sauce consistency here on this. Also so, got a chimichurri texture. Yeah. So not quite a full pesto. Yeah, exactly. We don't really want to blend it up. Full pesto there. We need to be about half a cup or so, maybe three fourths a cup of oil. All right. There we go. So then that kind of then that becomes our little sauce there that we're going to put on top of our fried green tomatoes there. Nice. All right. Okay. So we'll set that aside. Now, dust off our cutting board here. Uh, next, I think we're done with our cutting board, so we'll fold that in the sink. All right. Kids, watch that cutting board for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we'll get out our goat cheese. I like to keep the goat cheese in the uh, in the refrigerator. Try to keep it as chilled as possible until we're ready to use it. So yeah, it makes it a little um, bit easier to cut. Yeah, absolutely. Helps keep it shape. If you let it sit at room temp, if anybody's dealt with goat cheese, it just kind of starts to spread like butter, crumble a little bit. And you could lay these lay these green tomatoes out. And you could crumble the goat cheese on top if you'd like, but um, I'm going to do more of like a caprese, some more, kind of more stacked. And so I take a... I say this is fresh of, floss, right? Not used? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I didn't, I didn't pull it. Yeah, I didn't use it. And it is plain. Um, you know, you, um, you don't want to have like, like mint flavored floss. I guess if you wanted cinnamon on your goat cheese, you could do cinnamon, but... Hey, maybe. Oh, just, maybe. You never know. Yeah. Maybe a little wintergreen. <laughs> oh, little, yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, well, what, 
we used to do in kitchens, we'd have a lot of these to slice and, you know, that gums up the knife after a bit. Uh, you don't want to run your knife under hot water all the time. So you just use your floss and cut straight down and pull out there. And sometimes you kind of might have to clean off the goat cheese a little bit there. But you keep it nice and tight. Can you all see that okay? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I think we can see that pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, let me switch Hard to, to see. Light on here, but. All right. And we just want to cut these, you know, about the same thickness as our green tomatoes. All right. And just kind of slide it under. And as we go through and as we cut these, then we have our nice little even slices here like so. so now you uh, could get a little crazy and fry those too. <laughs> yeah, I've you know, got some breading there. You could definitely fry those up. You bet. Yeah, I used to work in a oh, country club. Fry. We used to fry little uh, goat cheese medallions, and that was our crouton oh, on yeah. our, uh, our salad. Oh, man, that sounds delicious. Not fun to make so a just, thousand of those, though. <laughs> no, I bet not, man, especially with goat cheese, man. That stuff starts to fall apart. It's definitely a temperature-sensitive thing, so. All right, I'm going to. So that's how, that's that's one of my fun kitchen hacks slash kitchen utensils, the kitchen tools there, floss to cut goat cheese. You can also uh, cut cream cheese that way too. Um, so that's always kind of fun. So I'm going to grab a hack of the day. Grab a plate here to plate these up. And I've got all kinds of stuff in the cupboards, man. All right. So when we go to uh, plate these guys up, we we'll just take a tomato, and take maybe a slice or two of of uh, goat cheese. We'll take one there, all right? And just kind of layer it like so. Whoop, like that. All right. And then we uh, take another little tomato here. Yeah, what's nice is the heat from the fried green tomatoes will kind of seep into that uh, goat cheese, soften it up a little bit. It'll get a lot softer as you're um, after you plate it and yeah. you serve it to everybody. Yeah. Now I've got these. I've got these uh, little cherry tomatoes here. You know, so I had the cherries over there, and I got these multicolored cherry tomatoes. These are kind of funny these little marble ones. Oh, yeah. They're kind of cool. You got the heirloom cherry tomatoes. Yep, maybe a few a pear tomatoes too. So we'll take a few of these guys and uh, scoot our goat cheese over here. Well, I'm cooking a little messy today. <laughs> Listen, my wife heard that. She said, just, just today? today? <laughs> All right, so we'll just cut these guys in half. Expose that nice, that beautiful inside of the tomato there. I love these kind of tomatoes, man. I like that little pop that they give to dishes, not look from a visual standpoint and from flavor and texture standpoint as well. All right, and we'll just throw these in this little bowl here. Take a little bit of our of our just a little herb sauce here. Kind of stir those up. You just kind of want to coat them just a little bit with some, you know, a little bit of oil, give them some sheen and whatnot. So now we've got you just kind of kind of place those around your plate like so. Or again, if you want to do like a larger batch of these, you could. You know, just do like a, a big a big platter of this stuff with uh, your tomatoes on there. So throw a few of those on, like so. Move this over here. Move this stuff out of the way. All right. And then we take our our little jalapeno basil pecan sauce here. We just kind of drizzle it right over top. A little bit of oil or something around, like so. Looks good. All right, and then you, you can add some a vinegar to it, or you know, like a vinegar reduction or something. Um, 
you know, you could uh, you know, add that vinegar component there to it or whatever. Yeah, but. like a balsamic reduction or um, I'm trying to think, what do I got? I have this Italian vinegar. vinegar that my friends brought back to me. Ooh, nice. And uh, it's like a white balsamic. Um, and it's not a reduction. Yeah. It's just been in the barrel for so long that it's um, re the ox or the liquid has uh, evaporated off and it's thick like syrup. Oh, really? So good. Perfect on something like this. Yeah, definitely. And that's your true age balsamic vinegar there. So, all right. So there's our, our uh, fried green tomato caprese there. Then we've got our... Our cherry crisp here. Let's check out our peach tart. See how we're doing on that guy. Oh man, got our little a little peach tart here. Oh, you even have a little rustic uh, cutting board to put your rustic peach tart on. All right, and then we get some uh, ice cream here. We have our ice cream ready to go and scoop somewhere. Got all these kitchen tools. In. <laughs> Got that. All right, so then we take our little yeah. scoop of our ice cream here. Nice, perfect little scoop. Let it melt down in there. Right on top of our. Our berry crisp here, or our cherry crisp, excuse me. All right, another one right there on top of our awesome our peach there. So and there we've got it, ladies and gentlemen. We have our fried green tomato and caprese salad with with goat cheese and a uh, basil pecan sauce, and then we've got our our cherry crisp. Remember, we had that that uh, citrus zest inside of there, or crumble on top. And then we've got our leftover grilled peach rustic tart. Awesome. And we have that looks so, great. All right, yeah, three Let's dishes. Actually, knock them out real quick. Yeah, you know, for a summer. I mean, this is actually a this is not a bad little meal to have. It's fried, you know, the green tomatoes, but you could just take one away and you could do two of them. You know, you got some fresh tomatoes on there and your fresh herbs. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you could do this for a little, you know, for a little get together or something like that if you wanted, or, you know, a little light meal or whatever. But, um, yeah, I think it's pretty simple and very, very scream summer, I think, you know? So, <laughs> Cindy says she cooks messy too, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, actually, I'm kind of here to see what what the inside of one of these tomatoes looks like. Let me cut this guy open. Yeah. Yeah. While you're doing that, I'm gonna kind of get set up here. And we only got a few more minutes. Um, ooh, there we go. Oh, let me switch. Let me get a little bit. Nice little breading on the outside. Still has some tomato. Still has some texture to it. Oh man. Yep. Nice. That looks delicious. Man. All right. All right cool. Um, so I know we only got a few more minutes, um, but, you know, kind of the, you know, we made some sauerkraut a couple of weeks ago, so I wanted to check in on that. It's about ready. I think we're looking at, I think we're right at three weeks, right? Almost four yeah. weeks. Um, so if you, if you look in real close here, actually, here, let me switch. Yeah, absolutely. There we go. So if you look in real close there, you start to get all the bubbles. And that is our friend lactic acid bacteria doing its thing, converting any sugar or anything into lactic acid. Um, and what we do is we created a salt brine to keep other bacteria from growing. So lactic, lactic acid, lactobacillus, um, thrives in um, anaerobic environments and the salt really kind of keeps other bacteria from growing. Um, and so with, with 
the sauerkraut, we kind of talked about it before, but um, what you're taking, you're taking your total weight of your uh, your uh, cabbage, um, and then you're ultimately when we're brining things or fermenting things, we want a brine solution of anywhere from two percent to five percent. Um, and the easy way to convert that, um, I mean, I do almost everything in uh, traditional American uh, gallons, cups, quarts. Uh, but for, I've started moving towards uh, metric a lot, and especially for things like this. So um, to get that um, 5%, uh, you just go with one liter of water and 50 grams of salt. Uh, so for here today, we're going to do some uh, pickles real quick. Um, let me get back here. So I got two liters of water. And then I got my scale here. And we're going to, you... yep, go ahead. Is it, is, it, is it important to have like um, distilled water for that or is tap water just fine? Or? So, you know, I go with, uh, I have a filter over here. Let me actually bring it over here. I'll show you, see if my cord's long enough. There we go. Um, so I have um, a Berkey water filter, uh, but you can use water from your fridge too. And, okay. but it's so kind of depending on your tap water because some tap water has some extra chlorine in it. Um, if you can yeah. smell chlorine in your water, uh, then make sure you're using filtered or you're buying distilled. Um, and so, yeah, because that chlorine will actually kind of stop the bacteria from growing. It kind of stunts the growth on it. Um, it can even keep it from fer fermenting at all, depending on how much chlorine is in your water. Um, yeah. And so, one for every liter, so we have two liters, so we're going to go with, let's get up to 100 grams. See that here? There we go. A little bit much. And that's how much we're gonna go. Two liters and 100 grams of salt. Now, I've already done the work. So you you want to heat up your water, dissolve your salt in there, and you're pretty much ready to go. Um, and so with cucumbers. Uh, so I said anywhere from 2% to 5% of a solution on your brine. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, my sound is choppy now. Oh, no. Well, I'll, I'll just get through this real quick then. Um, you always want to account for... Let me turn off my fan. Maybe that's it. All right. Uh, you do want to account for how much water is going to come out of the vegetables. Uh, so, because if cucumbers have a lot of liquid in it, and when you go to um, ferment them, they're actually going to release a lot of liquid too. And then that'll actually dilute your solution. If your solution gets below that 2% range, other bacteria can grow in it. Um, and so we want to kind of up and go on the higher end to that 5% solution. So that way we can make sure that we are um, still within that range and we only have the good bacteria growing. So let me just do a quick little demo. We're going to cut the tips off. And we're going to cut them into spears. And we're just going to go into quarters here. And then you just want to stuff them down into your jar. So we'll just do a couple more to get the effect. And we don't need to sit through all of this. These are perfect little pickling cucumbers. We're gonna leave that there. Are they like curvy cucumbers or what's the? Uh, yes, these are pickling cucumbers I got from the uh, farmer's market. Yeah, and they're, they're like a curvy cucumber. Okay. And you can buy pickling cucumbers in the grocery store too. Okay. All right, so we're gonna get those in there. All right, I'm not gonna go through and do it all, but basically you wanna take that, then you're gonna take a little bit of dill. Thank you, Kim Bowman. Drop that in there. And then you're just gonna pour your brine over it. And you wanna make sure you're covering everything because like I said, you want to make sure that no other bacteria can get in here. And basically, all we do is 
make sure that nothing's touching the air. We can cover it up with the lid and we'll keep it out for a couple of days. And then as it starts to ferment, you'll start to see those bubbles like you do in here. And right as it really gets to the peak of fermentation and you start to see lots of bubbles, uh, that's where we'll put it in the fridge and then let it sit and it'll be good to go. Um, so like I said, we did our sauerkraut before. We didn't do it on the show, but I did some uh, pickled green beans and Brussels sprouts. And so this is really a good way to just use up whatever veg you have um, coming from your garden, coming from someone else's garden. Um, if you don't have a use for it in a recipe and you have so much that you can't... Um, oh. Is our, is our sound still choppy? Dang. I guess I'm, I'm hearing you through the computer, so I, I haven't experienced that. Okay. Well, hopefully we're okay. We're about done here anyways. Um, but, you know, this is always a really good way to, like I said, use up vegetables from your garden that you don't have a recipe to use them up for. So um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully our audio came back. Uh, but I think okay. that's it on the ferment stuff. Yeah, I think, you know, with different foods we had fermented and we talked about like cauliflower and carrots and um, you know even kimchi is a type of is a, is a form of fermenting and um, uh, I think we've we talked about kimchi a couple weeks ago with the, the mac and cheese so putting that into our mac and cheese there so uh, very similar process but yeah you're absolutely right you want to ha definitely have a clean environment on that and um, <laughs> You know, making sure it's kind of it's kind of like baking in a way. You know, you make sure it's almost perfect, if not perfect, because um, you know, again, if if you're creating a big batch of that, you definitely don't want bacteria in there, and you don't want to be sick from that stuff. So <laughs> it's definitely good to know that information. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, I think my audio's back. I think I might be uh, testing out this new camera setup over here. Uh, so oh, we'll okay. work on that. But all right. So I Very think uh, I think that's it for today. Yeah, nice job, Jimmy, on the fermenting there. Now you have some pickles in a couple of weeks we can check out. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll definitely check those out. And uh, maybe next time I see you, I'll give you a jar of those uh, pickled green beans and Brussels sprouts. All right, sounds good. Well, I, I wish I could keep the uh, fried green tomatoes and the crisp until then. but <laughs> Yeah, that's all right. All right, well, you know, thank everybody for joining us. Um, Thanks, all. Appreciate you being here. We're, Thank you for your support. we're kind of working through what we're doing next week, but I think we're going to do a, a stuffed chicken breast. Um, you know, you got a really cool stuffed chicken breast. We'll put that recipe up. And uh, we're hoping on maybe getting a live wine tasting out in California with our uh, uh, with Mackenzie, um, our social media coordinator, kind of helping us out on that end while she's out there. So should be fun. Yeah, maybe she can pair wine with our chicken dish that we're going to do. There so. we go. All right. Thanks, folks. We'll see you later. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.